Welcome back to the Hardware Unbox News Corner. I hope everyone is coping well with the current situation around the world, staying home where possible, enjoying some social distancing and having, yeah, as much fun as possible while in lockdown. A few people have been asking us what our situation is and, well, it's mostly business as usual. Both Steve and I already work from home, so there's been little impact to us from lockdowns, and so far we've been able to create content as normal. So you shouldn't see many, if any, changes from us throughout this time. If you want PC hardware news and analysis, we'll be keeping you up to date with everything that's going on as normal and checking out any latest releases if they actually manage to get out during this time. This week has been an interesting one for news because the 2020 Game Developers Conference was supposed to be running running throughout the week, but of course it got cancelled due to human malware. That hasn't stopped a bunch of companies from releasing news on whatever they've been working on, so let's dive into the big announcements of the week. The first one here is the official hardware specifications for the Xbox Series X and the PlayStation 5, the two big next-gen game consoles that will be coming later this year. I'm not going to talk a lot about what the individual consoles are doing because we basically never analyze consoles, but with these specs out now in the wild, I figure it's a good time to discuss how the hardware in these consoles might translate to PC hardware and gaming uh, yeah, in the coming years. So. The CPU in both of these consoles won't surprise anyone. We've got eight Zen 2 cores with SMT for a total of 16 threads. The Xbox Series X clocks up to 3.8 GHz or 3.6 with SMT, while the PS5 uses a variable clock speed that caps at 3.5 gigahertz. We don't have any information on other aspects to hardware like the cache, which for Ryzen CPUs is quite important. In terms of PC hardware, we already have chips that should deliver similar performance to what these consoles are doing. The closest equivalent, of course, is the Ryzen 7 3700X, which is clocked with a 3.6 gigahertz base and 4.4 gigahertz boost. The 3700X, like many of AMD Zen 2 CPUs, tend to hit around 4 GHz all-core stock, so the consoles will likely have at least a 10 to 15% clock speed deficit over the equivalent desktop chip. On top of this, some CPU resources will be reserved for the console's OS and other systems, the Xbox Series X, for example, is reserving one core for that. Given the huge performance uplift over the current console's Jaguar cores, it's fair to say next-gen games will be more CPU demanding as developers find ways to harness the increase in CPU power available. Over time, this will likely mean that 8-core CPUs will be needed for gaming, but not right away. We're probably still a few years away from that, and even with the reserving of some resources for the system on the consoles, it's possible that powerful 6-core CPUs, if multi-threading is up to task, still are quite capable throughout this next generation. The GPU side is where people are getting very excited. Both consoles pack RDNA 2-based GPUs with hardware-accelerated ray tracing. It sounds like that ray tracing component is actually quite powerful. The Xbox Series X features 52 compute units clocked at 1825 MHz with 56 compute units on the die, so there's four locked there for yields, producing around 12 teraflops of power. The PlayStation 5 uses 36 compute units at 2230 MHz for a peak of just over 10 teraflops. So there's a few really interesting things to note here. Firstly, the PlayStation 5 is able to clock its GPU quite high, certainly a fair bit higher than we typically see out of first-gen RDNA parts. The Radeon RX 5700, which is a 36 compute unit part, has a 1635 MHz game clock, while the 5700 XT hits around 1755 MHz. Even AMD only rates the absolute maximum boost clock for these parts at 1980 MHz for the 5700 XT Anniversary Edition. So the PlayStation 5 is already pushing clocks 13% higher. This bodes well for AMD's next-gen RDNA 2 GPUs. Based on what we're seeing here, it should be possible to not only get an increase in compute units from a wider GPU design, but also an increase in frequency. Whether these two things is, are achievable at the same time remains to be seen. However, at the very least, there should be gains available in both departments. Unfortunately, though, we can't say how they've been able to achieve this. Is it down to a use of an enhanced 7 nanometer manufacturing process, or is it architectural changes? It, it's too hard to say at this point. The other exciting thing for PC gamers is the density AMD is achieving with the SOCs for these consoles. As we know, producing larger dies is more costly and more prone to yield-related issues, so packing in as much stuff into a small package gives huge advantages for the price points these chips can hit. The Xbox Series X SoC packs everything into 360 square millimeters, so that's all 56 compute units, the 8 Zen 2 cores, and everything else. 
Currently, AMD's top 7 nanometer designs are 40 RDNA CUs in 251 square millimeter for the 5700 XT series, or 60 5th gen GCN compute units in 331 square millimeters with Radeon 7. What this all means is it should be quite feasible for AMD to produce a large compute unit die in a relatively small amount of space. It's really hard to nail down a specific number for these sorts of things, not knowing the exact layout of the chips and the gains with using an enhanced process node. But you'd expect a, a mid-size 250 to 300 square millimeter standalone GPU to hit at least the 56 compute unit size of the Xbox Series X. So quite possibly we'll see next gen mid to upper mid-range parts with Series X type GPUs. Lots of people are going crazy thinking this Series X will wipe out PC gaming because of how powerful it is, but I don't really see it this way. Whatever is possible in the console should be achievable in a relatively affordable mid-range part on the PC, which is what we saw with the last gen console transition as well. Then of course, if AMD decides to go crazy with a 300 to 400 square millimeter chip for the high end, they should be able to cram in a pretty crazy amount of compute units and really push the boundaries of PC gaming in a die size that is actually feasible, providing more performance than these next-gen consoles. Again, I don't want to make any specific estimates here because they'll just be wrong and highly speculative, but the specs of these consoles do point to exciting things for RDNA 2 and a big return to form for AMD in the GPU front. Of course, while it's great to get excited about new AMD GPUs, Nvidia also has an upcoming generational shift when they transition down to seven nanometers. So they too should be able to increase compute unit counts, shrink current designs to do all sorts of things there, maybe make those chips a bit more affordable. So we won't just be getting enhancements on the AMD front. Nvidia will still be very competitive, if not outright leaders, given where they already stand on 12 nanometer. But either way you look at it, this next generation of GPUs is shaping up to be highly competitive on both sides. AMD has already talked about the 50% efficiency gains they've achieved with RDNA 2. We're now seeing high compute unit counts in a relatively small SOC package, and NVIDIA has a node shrink coming up, so it's very exciting times there, I think. A couple of other things worth mentioning, both consoles pack 16 gigabytes of GDDR6 memory. The PS5 hits 448 gigabytes per second of throughput across all of it through a 256 bit wide bus, while the Series X is using a split design with higher and lower bandwidth segments. Some of this memory will be reserved for system use, but we can expect VRAM requirements to rise with this generation, and that will typically lead to probably more VRAM on discrete GPUs as well. Storage has also been a huge talking point, and we see for the PS5 we're getting an 825 gigabyte custom SSD with 5.5 gigabytes per second raw IO throughput. The Series X is taking a slow approach with a one terabyte SSD that hits 2.4 gigabytes per second raw speeds. Both systems will also use compression technology to increase the effective bandwidth and each has a few tricks up their sleeve as well. This will no doubt lead to an increase in storage speed requirements for PC gamers. The speeds we're talking about here are PCIe NVMe class, so very much your upper mid-range SSDs. The PS5 in particular is hitting high-end M.2 PCIe 4.0 SSD speed. So over time, you'd expect this sort of hardware to be necessary for some of the things PC games will do, but the transition period as we move towards that will be interesting as well. Will PC gamers with slower storage face more loading screens, or will game performance drop? We'll just have to see how that one plays out. So that's, I think, enough on all these specs, but certainly some interesting times ahead for gaming and PC hardware. I think we can expect fairly substantial gains to all aspects of gaming in this upcoming generation. Speaking of more upcoming generation stuff, Microsoft has announced DirectX 12 Ultimate. This is the DirectX feature set that will form the next generation of gaming, both for PC gaming and the Xbox Series X. Not everything in DirectX 12 Ultimate is new. It takes a lot of the features that were previously available with DirectX 12 and DirectX 12.1, but provides a superset that also incorporates features like ray tracing. There are four major feature additions to DirectX 12 Ultimate. One is, of course, DirectX Ray Tracing version 1.1, which is the latest version. If a GPU wants to support DirectX 12 Ultimate, it has to have support for ray tracing acceleration in some form. This means NVIDIA can and will be supporting DirectX 12 Ultimate with their Turing architecture, but AMD won't until RDNA 2 is released. 
DirectX 12 Ultimate also incorporates variable rate shading tier 2, which is a feature that's been around for a while now. This feature allows the GPU to adjust its shading rate depending on the content. So it'll prioritize high detail, high visibility areas, and it might shade less important stuff at a lower rate. This improves performance at a very minor cost of visual quality and has already been implemented as an optional feature in games such as Wolfenstein 2. Also included in DX12 Ultimate is the next generation of geometry pipelines, Mesh Shaders. This pipeline is more efficient and more powerful than what we currently have and brings added flexibility to developers. One of Nvidia's slides shows the advantages of Mesh Shaders in GPU-controlled LOD selection. It may take a while for developers to wrap their heads around how Mesh Shaders work, but it is a feature of DX12 Ultimate. And finally, we get to sampler feedback, a relatively new feature. NVIDIA's blog has a great explanation of how sampler feedback will be able to improve game performance. It essentially allows the game engine to reuse parts of texture calculations for improved efficiency, among other things. Like with any DirectX feature update, it will take developers a while to begin using all of these features, so don't worry, your current or previous generation GPU that might not support DX12 Ultimate won't be obsolete just yet, but this is a look ahead to what game developers now have access to for creating better, more efficient game worlds across the next generation of consoles. So yeah, exciting stuff. AMD has shown off ray tracing on their RDNA 2 architecture as part of today's DirectX 12 Ultimate announcements. The demo is an extremely shiny chrome city with lots of reflective surfaces, more than you'd ever expect to actually be used, but the point here is to show off ray trace reflections, not a super realistic environment. The demo uses DXR 1.1 features, which was developed as a joint effort between Microsoft, AMD, and NVIDIA going off statements from all three companies. Some people have commented on the performance of this demo, despite the video being uploaded at 60 FPS, the rendering is clearly locked to 24 FPS. Not sure why this is the case, but I wouldn't be reading too much into the performance scene in these sorts of demos here. We really have no idea what is going on. In fact, the demo actually feels like it's being played back at a lower frame rate than it was actually rendered at. It seems a bit slow motion to me, so again, don't really know the reasoning behind that, but still, AMD has ray tracing working on RDNA 2 silicon, so that'll probably be exciting people. Few quick topics to round this one out. Intel has accidentally disclosed the existence of another Comet Lake U-series processor, the Core i7-10810U. This came as part of a product change notification informing customers that some of their U-series parts will be manufactured at a different site in Vietnam. The actual notification is pretty boring, just saying that some products will have a different manufacturing country printed on the box. But the disclosure of the 10810U, 10810U, terrible name still, the Core i7-10810U, this disclosure is a bit surprising. Not much is known about the 10810U because Intel isn't disclosing specifications at this stage. The most likely situation is that this is a higher clocked and or better binned version of the Core i7-10710U. The 10710 u the 10710 u is the only 6-core, 12-thread part in Intel's 15-watt U-series lineup, so adding in a second part with potentially higher clocks could make some sense. And there might be room for additional clocks here because if we look at the turbo speeds for the 10710U, we see a maximum single core speed of 4.7 gigahertz, which is lower than the 4.9 gigahertz provided by the quad core Core i7-10510U that sits below it. Perhaps this is one area Intel will look to increase with a new CPU, similar to the differences Intel provided in the previous generation with the Core i7-8565U and 8665U, the 8665 u having a 100 megahertz higher base clock and 200 megahertz higher turbo. As for why Intel might want a Core i7-10810U, I think I'm getting used to that name now, in their lineup, well, that's less clear. It could be a response to AMD's upcoming Ryzen 4000 U series chips. Maybe Intel wants slightly higher clock speeds to combat that part, or it could just be a standard revision of what they already have on the market. Intel often does that sort of thing. We'll just have to wait and see. And final topic for this week, perhaps not as many topics as we might normally have, but this one I think is still going to be interesting to some people. NVIDIA were expecting to announce some stuff at their GTC 2020 conference, which was scheduled for next week. Due to human malware, there's been a series of changes from the event getting cancelled with online presentations to then no presentations and now to nothing at all. So there won't be 
any announcements. It's not clear what NVIDIA would have been announcing at the show. I don't have any idea personally, but I would have thought the event is too early to show off a new gaming GPU architecture. So anything there would have been more focused on the developer and data center side. But regardless, the announcements have been delayed. So we'll have to wait and see what happens there. And that's it for this week's News Corner Interesting Times and a bit of a look into the future of what to expect for PC gaming. Lots of exciting things coming up in the next year or so that I'm personally very excited for. As always, you can subscribe to catch this segment in your inbox every Friday. Hit the bell notification icon as well. You get notifications so you don't miss anything. You can, of course, support us through Patreon and the merch store. Links to that are in the description below. And I'll catch you in the next one.